Another year of WWE's special brand of sports entertainment has come and gone, and boy, what a wild year it was. We've seen matches, rivalries, and plot lines that range from all-time classics to downright terrible and everything in between. Very few years have been as active as this one. We've also seen more of the inner workings of the WWE throughout this year than ever before. Shoot interviews, sudden departures, crazy swerves, and crowd takeovers have brought on a massive amount of controversy to the brand, some of which will be felt for years to come. In this episode of The Haymakers, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the more important events and moments that happened throughout this year in WWE, and how they affect the company and wrestling as a whole in the future. Welcome to The Haymakers 2014 in Review. Hello everyone, I am Tune Critic Y2K, your cult of personality. Who do I have here with me today? You have Nick E V. And you have DJ Calcos. Same three schmucks that have been doing this for god only knows how long. How many and months? And we're gonna do it again! Yay! Oh yeah. We've yeah, actually yeah, been doing this since uh SummerSlam. No, oh, longer than that. Oh, you you were here since SummerSlam. Yeah, you joined. That's that's when you joined. Like yeah. literally, we just picked you. It's just like, hey, he's the dude that likes wrestling, right? Fuck it, bring him in. <laughs> and yeah. Then, and then Night of Champions rolls around, and then Zach gets that infamous YouTube comment. Is like, hey, Calcos, Nikki, you want to do a permanent podcast? We can we can record these like once per week or or whenever we feel like it, and then it'll be fun and 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 stuff. And that's our 2014 in review. Basically, yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah. So, we've got quite a few things to talk about. I mean, 2014 as a whole has been uh, very interesting. So, um, Calgos, where do you think we should start? I think we should start with the event that should have been incredibly bad, but ended up being arguably the best event of the entire year all around. It started with the departure of a certain punk, and with the Royal Rumble winnings of a certain Dave Bautista, or I should say Drax instead, because that's who he is now. Deal with it. The crowd decided they had enough, and they started to hashtag take over Raw. The company listened, they put Daniel Bryan at the front, and along with an up-to-down card of great matches involving the likes of The Undertaker, Bray Wyatt, John Cena, Cesaro, Big Show, Sheamus, and Brock Lesnar, we have... One of the best WrestleManias of the last decade, WrestleMania 30. This entire pay-per-view is the only pay-per-view in its entirety that deserves its own highlight this year. Because holy crap! This is the pay-per-view that got me back into wrestling. This, this is the good stuff. This is what the WWE can be on its best day, and it was fucking awesome! This is what happens when the WWE finally decides to listen to us and say, you know what, fine, we'll take the chance. This whole entire WrestleMania, I had doubts in. This is kind of when I thought, okay, if WrestleMania 30 does not impress me or at least gets my interest, then I'm done. But obviously it worked because otherwise I wouldn't be here hosting this. So, <laughs> yeah, WrestleMania 30. There was a thing about eight matches uh, half of which was good, and the other half, which was okay. Like, n none of these matches were really bad. There was just some that were okay, and then there were some that were really fucking good. Yeah, because nobody's going to remember uh, the S.H.I.E.L.D. squashing Kane in the New Age Outlaws. That was just kind of... It, it literally was done in less than three minutes. It was just... but Yeah, the squash I was not expecting, but hey, the S.H.I.E.L.D. WrestleMania... Yay. <laughs> To be fair, their la their last WrestleMania match they had was a lot better. Yeah, yeah, it was. But yeah, let I say we talk about like the absolute biggest thing that we are going to be talking about until the end of our wrestling days. Brock Lesnar breaking the streak that, like, which me, wasn't even supposed to happen. Yeah, because fucking Lesnar fucked it up, and it's just like, oh shit, I accidentally hurt Taker. Uh, 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 F five. Um, yay, I broke the streak. 
which he wasn't even supposed to fucking do in the first place. No, yeah. yes, he was, actually. The Undertaker did choose Brock Lesnar to end the streak. <laughs> this is was always chosen beforehand, and keep in mind, The Undertaker is the biggest traditionalist of the modern age. If he was not supposed to drop the streak at that moment, he wasn't gonna fucking do it. Yes, Undertaker get, did get hurt. Yes, after he walked from the mat, he was rushed to the hospital with Vince McMahon at his side. Yes, this is all true. But there is no way in hell that The Undertaker would have dropped the streak unless he died in the goddamn ring. It's just not fathomable for him to do something like that. He chose Lesnar. I would have chosen either Triple H or Shawn Michaels, personally. I mean, they would have seemed like the better people to do it. And with Lesnar... <sighs> That's the whole the, I, match... Okay, 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 okay. I need to explain a thing to you. The reason why it, um, it would have been better for Shawn Michaels or Triple H to do it is the exact reason why it shouldn't have been either of them. The breaking of the streak is not supposed to be a feel-good moment. It is not supposed to be something that you feel comfortable with. It's supposed to go to one of the guys that you think could beat the streak, but probably won't. And now that he does, you feel dirty. You feel violated. It feels as though the last 20 years of wrestling has been completely erased from your memory. That is big! That is absolutely huge. If it was a feel-good moment, the streak would not be as monumental. It would not feel as monumental when it was finally broken. And now that it was broken by a guy that we didn't really want to break the streak, it feels bad. And that's the point. That is why Brock Lesnar, to me, was the right choice. And on top of that, he's been... that, that That's the big reason why he's been able to be the biggest, baddest son of a gun in the company for the last uh, 10 months now. Because he's... He, he's the streak breaker. He is the man who broke the Undertaker's streak. And ever since then, he has been damn near unstoppable. And and the thing is, like, back when he was with uh, wrestling before, back in, like, 04 or something? I can't remember when that was. But, like, back then, he was great, but he was not, like, he, he, he wasn't as dominant as he is now. And because, you know, streak breaker, he now has that going for him. Whereas before, um, I could actually see that because Lesnar would then go on to crush Cena in the, <laughs> the most entertaining squash match I've ever seen to <laughs> just not doing anything after that, really. I would say, <sighs> as much as it hurt to see that match, I think it could have been done a little better, but... This was the shock moment that needed to happen because we hadn't gotten a moment like this in God only knows how long, you know? Like, this was one of those things that, like, the next big shock moment that's going to come, it, it's it's got this to go up against. And that's, got, that's a huge mountain to try to climb, so. Yeah. And before then, the whole pay-per-view was being built up for Daniel freaking Bryan. You know, Daniel Bryan was the main focus, but then we come to Undertaker's match, and then BAM! It just suddenly changes everything. It almost, I, would, I almost want to say it almost ruined the pay-per-view for me, but then I realized, you know what, that, that needed to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, because... Doesn't, I mean, it doesn't hurt Undertaker's credibility, and it only no. makes Brock Lesnar look like even more of a beast, so... Yeah, like, Undertaker's still a first ballot guaranteed hall of famer and brock has been able to ride off since then so yeah so then we can so speaking of daniel Bryan, we can jump back to how this whole pay-per-view was almost modeled around him starting with his match against triple h where if he won he would be able to enter the world heavyweight championship match later that night and we all know that was going to happen we all knew that daniel Bryan was going to overcome the most insane and insurmountable odds to gain the wwe world heavyweight championship by the way i just want to point out why is it nobody was freaking out over this when he won the world heavyweight championship probably because he wasn't as over at the time but they were making it a big deal, like, oh, you're never going to get the belt. You're never going to get such and such. When he won the belt before, it's just like, are we supposed to forget that? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you talking about the, um, the, uh, oh, are you talking about SummerSlam 2013 when he got screwed out of his win? No, because no, no. I'm talking count? about when he won the World Heavyweight Championship, you know, from cashing in Money in the Bank. 
I'm going to play devil's advocate and say that it's because they were able to use that logic because they unified the titles. Um, oh, but right. you're right in a way, but you're also wrong in a way. So it's uh, it's very confusing, but honestly, it's fucking wrestling, and wrestling is dumb. So there are certain <laughs> things that I've learned to roll with, and this is one of those things. So I, ju- I, I just that. bear with them at, the, at, at this point in time. But uh, yeah, Daniel Bryan... Very, very close to being a complete afterthought this WrestleMania. The main event was uh, supposed to be Batista versus Randy Orton. Thank yeah, because, God it wasn't. Yeah, and his. I think Vince's reasoning for that was that Batista had never had a WrestleMania moment. Like, he was never, like, basically, <laughs> same reason CM Punk left, because he never was able to have the big main event. And the problem with that is like well, well, Nick, if you think about it, the closest he's ever had to that was facing Undertaker at WrestleMania 23. Yeah, but at the same time, is he like think back to the good old days of Batista? Even then, was he the, the uh, mess, WrestleMania main eventer? WrestleMania 21. Ever... Mm, yeah, but other than that, I don't think he ever really truly got over. No, yeah. he he never got over at WrestleMania. Batista was always over at the other bigger pay-per-views. Keep in mind, he won the Royal Rumble in 2005, which is why he uh, main evented WrestleMania 21. I think, I think he did. I know he had a big role. He at did. WrestleMania Batista 21. Triple H was the last match. Okay, good. Um, well, then why did Vince say that Batista had never had a? WrestleMania that's Vin- that's a, that's Vince's way of saying my name is Vincent McMahon. So fuck you. Uh, yeah, that's true. Mm. You can never but forget this. The way that they build up the whole Daniel Bryan, you know, overcoming everybody, beating Triple H and Batista and Randy Orton in the same night. You know what? I would dare to say that the triple threat main event for the pay-per-view. Was I the only one getting some uh, WrestleMania 20 deja vu? Oh, shit. You're right. The mysterious third man, according to the WrestleMania 20 promotional trading cards. Printed <laughs> after 2007. <laughs> no, you're you're kind of right. That's very close to the Chris Benoit situation. Even down to the happened. ending with the tap out. I mean, it was almost exactly the same thing. They beat up Re- Daniel Bryan to the point where he had to be taken back. Then he came out. Then he beat up the guys. Then he made Batista tap out. You know what? I'm totally okay with it because it was amazing. It's it's quite awesome that when you take the overcome the odds scenario and take John Cena out and put anyone else in, it works. Because John Cena's done that whole scenario over and over and over again. You just kind of expect, oh, okay, fine, he's gonna win. No, that there's no problem there. But yeah. with Daniel Bryan overcoming it, you wanted that to happen. And he kept getting screwed and screwed and screwed over at every point. But this was his time. You know, this whole pay-per-view, like I said, was modeled around him winning the championship. Everything else in there was just kind of there. Except for yeah. take the match. But you know you know what I mean. Yeah. And ar- arguably the only other match on the card that had any real ramifications on anything in the future was Cesaro winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale. No, yeah. I disagree. Mm-hmm. That was that was huge. I disagree though. <clears throat> I think that the John Cena versus Bray Wyatt match was way more important than people think because mm. you go back and you watch that match and there's one thing is that is clear that was completely ruined by later matches that happened throughout the year of 2014. Bray Wyatt was not a main eventer before WrestleMania 13. I, I'm sorry, not WrestleMania 13, WrestleMania 30. 13? But, Damn, man. When, how far to go did we go back? Did Bray he fight Wyatt, Mike Tyson? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually WrestleMania 14, but I digress. Damn it! What the I fuck so ever? I making a good reference. Bray Wyatt <laughs> proved that he was a main eventer not tomorrow, not 30 minutes from then. He was a main eventer now, and he should still be a main eventer. He proved that in his match with Cena, even though the match was rife with um with uh, um interferences, and and uh, Cena ended up super Cena Cenaing out by attacking the Wyatt family with a chair. Bray Wyatt got so over after that match because he showed what he could do. And it was one of the only times I've ever seen anyone go over Cena after losing to him. 
And then he ended up getting buried, and I hate that because I'm such a huge Wyatt Mark, but I find it harder and harder and harder to like him as time goes on because of really crappy booking. Really crappy booking. It's the same thing with Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins is going to have the same exact problem that Bray Wyatt has right now because he's going up against Cena, and at the end of the day, Cena can't lose. So, if Cena doesn't lose, the other guy can't go over. And if the other guy doesn't go over, then he lingers in the mid-card forever. Why do you think Cena went up against The Rock twice? Yeah, you bring up a good point. It's it's awful. It's disgusting. That's why I'm a big fan of that uh, of that match, and that's why I wish that that match could have been a big turning point in the career and character of Bray Wyatt. Anyway, speaking of turning points about people's careers, let's talk about the Battle Royale. Yes. Yeah. That <laughs> hey, Beyond Vince? the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Hey, Vince, you know how you're saying uh, you can't figure out how to get that Swiss guy over? I think he's figured out how to get over by himself. Yeah. Man, I was not expecting Cesaro to do it. I honestly was thinking Big Show was going to do it, but then just like, lol, no, Cesaro. Yeah, well, to be fair, it like the Andre the Giant Memorial, like it, it's got the same... Oh, how do I put this? It it looked eerily similar to what happened with Hulk Hogan and Andre at WrestleMania 3. So can we also guess... very quickly before we get to that, can we also really quickly talk about nobody really expecting Hulk Hogan to come back <laughs> to, you know, host WrestleMania and everything? Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of. He was at TNA at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he was at like uh, it, it was close. It was close at that time. Nobody really he, expected Hogan to come back to WWE, so it what it didn't quite have the same effect as The Rock coming back. But you know, it's at least worth mentioning. You know that nobody really expected him to come back. I'm looking it up. See what the time was when he was with TNA. It was around that time, I believe. So, um, uh, okay, he quit TNA. In October of 2013, and in February of 2014, he was coming back to WWE. Okay. Well, he's the one responsible, I guess, for the whole Andre the Giant Battle Royal thing, and he also is, I guess, partially responsible for having, um, in some way, helping Cesaro get over. All right, that's really cool, Hulk Hogan. Good job. I applaud you. Now, on your list of pluses, you're up to 34. But on your list of minuses, you still have 45,000, so you've got some catching up to do. <laughs> eh, most of that stuff happened at WCW. That shouldn't count. No, it totally <laughs> does, because WCW at one point was really fucking great. So, fuck you, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> anyway, do we have anything else to say about WrestleMania 30? Um, Not really. There's really no other matches on there. AJ Lee's match, uh, the Usos match, um... Shield squash match. Um, That's it, uh, the moment with Hogan and Rock and Austin being in the ring at the same time. That, that was cool. cool. <laughs> that was really cool to open up the pay per view and shit. It's just like, oh look, it's Hulk Hogan. It's just, oh no, it's Sto it's Stone Cold. Holy shit, it's The Rock. Now I'm thinking to myself, now if John Cena had come out at that point, that would have been like you know, like the big the big generation gap. The, I think the Mount Rushmore. Yeah, of, like the the biggest ones. That, 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 was, that was the only time I was thinking, okay, now Cena just needs to come out and this moment would, would be perfect. No, he, he's going to have to retire first. Yeah, I can see that. Anyway. Um, WrestleMania 30, pretty fucking great. Yeah. But not as great, though. As, as... the other great pay-per-view of 2014, which, honestly, I didn't see coming at all. Like, of the big four pay-per-views... WrestleMania is the biggest. Uh, Royal Rumble and SummerSlam are somewhere in the middle. Survivor Series is the runt of the litter of the four. Like it, it, it's especially in the era where there's a tag team match every single week on Raw between a bunch of big guys. A five on five elimination match just doesn't have the same luster that it used to. But holy shit, this one had some luster to it. What we can summarize uh, Survivor Series 2014 with is that while there were some okay matches on there, what we have to talk about, uh, Nick, you, you can probably introduce this, the main event. Yes! Team Cena, John Cena, Dolph Ziggler, Big Show, Eric Rowan, and Ryback versus 
Seth Rollins, Kane, Mark Henry, Rusev, Luke Harper, and about a dozen other people in their corner for Team Authority. Okay. First off, the match started out hilariously with Big Show one-punching Mark Henry out and pinning him in less than a minute. That was hilarious. Before we go on, though, I want to say how important that was because here's the thing. <clears throat> this was one of the first times this entire year is not, not first, but only times this entire year. I wanted Cena to win and they did a very good job of getting me invested. The promos were very good leading up to it. The go home match leading up to it with the whole Luke Harper, Eric Rowan side swapping shit was really neat. It got me invested. And then the instant big show knocked out Mark Henry 30 seconds into the match. I was just, I was on the edge of my seat from there. That was such a, perfect way to kick off the match sorry mark henry but your sacrifice was not in vain anyway please continue but then after that the rest of team cena besides one person kind of phoned it in the rest of the way well not really phoned it in but um how should i put this uh dolph ziggler kind of took over from there like it, be- it went from team cena to, z- to, to fucking team ziggy yes Ryback got eliminated, but then after that, Ziggler was sort of responsible for knocking out Rusev. Smart booking decision, mind you. Very yes. smart booking decision. Probably the only smart booking decision of 2014. Put that shit on a pedestal, give it a blue ribbon, and you can look at it when you're feeling down, WWE. <laughs> I will Great give booking. them a golf clap. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rusev, and this is Jackass. Wee! <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but then uh, Team Authority got on a roll. They took out Rowan. Cena got n- betrayed by the big backstabber, Big Show. Well, uh, I I still don't get why. It's just like, fucking, you can't put Big Show on any team. He's just going to fucking betray you. <laughs> to be honest, I'm okay with this, if only because Cena did absolutely no work, which did, which actually, for me, being a fucking dumbass anti-Cena sh- piece of shit smart. When Cena got hot tagged, I was rooting for him. That's how invested the WWE got me into this match. It sucked me in like a triple vagina whore. Like What? It- what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you what? say it, that it, one it, more it's time? It's simple. It sucked me in like a like a whore that has three vaginas. It's it's simple. Okay. Yeah, that's that simple. <laughs> the match the match really got me which is why i was rooting for cena and then cena put ups like puts up like no offense for all of 30 seconds that he's tagged in and then the big show hits him and knocks him out that was really disheartening because we were all expecting the super cena at some point in the match even if it wasn't him to overcome the odds we were all expecting him to put in his fair share he never did he got fucked in the ass right as he got tagged in uh seth rollins pins him big show leaves and gets counted out and then you have 3v1 with dolph ziggler fucking weak as shit against kane rollins and harper can i can i also just quickly say what do you think was more embarrassing cena in this match or cena versus lesnar at summerslam what do you think was more embarrassing summerslam you know what i'm gonna agree what do you think nick i'd say it's closer than that but I would lean a little bit towards Cena, if only because it was for the title. Like, Cena did literally nothing in this match. He he was in for barely any time at all, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess SummerSlam. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, it was, it was for fucking Ziggler against Kane, Harper, and Rollins. At this point, I'm like, okay, th- there is no way in hell they're going to make Ziggler the guy to, like, overcome all of this, because... What had Ziggler really done? He was like kind of floundering around just doing his own thing, whether he was having the Intercontinental Championship or losing it or going after a title and then losing and then all this other stuff. He hadn't really found anything to do this year that was worthwhile up until this, where he goes fucking Super Ziggler. We found the debut of Super Ziggler. We found the debut of Super Ziggler. Uh, yeah. uh, again, th- I repeat, it's amazing when you take the overcome the odds scenario and put it on someone other than Cena. It's quite amazing. It um, can even work with Cena because that was the whole case with this rivalry. 
Like they were stacking, like they were getting the biggest, baddest sons of guns that they could find to put against him. And it looked like he was going to lose, especially after the the betrayal from the big show. It's like, oh God, the odds have been stacked too far. We finally found something to take down Super Cena. Yeah, but then it just goes on and on with like Ziggler beating up Kane. He's just, oh shit, zigzag. There he goes. Kane is down. Oh God, roll up on Harper. It's over. At that point, I'm like, okay, so where's Rollins to come in and screw this all up? But no, they keep going for at least like five more minutes. And they're, <laughs> and just when it looks like all hell is going to go down, Triple H gets into the ring. The referees are going to knock down. All hell is breaking loose. And then Cole made a call that I'm never going to forget. I I can still hear it echoing in my head that call that that call that Cole made when he walked out. Oh my God! It's Sting. Seven time WCW champion, two time NWA champion. No mention of TNA, by the way. That's forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say TNA. You can't say TNA. Oh, wait, if somebody can get away with saying total nonstop action, but you can't say TNA on television. It's like if somebody took a company and made CM Punk out of it, they can never mention it ever again. Now, guys, I would like to reiterate, though, that I know a lot of people when they watched the pay-per-view live, uh, they they l- saw the intro and they were like, the crowd cheered, but it wasn't that loud. Well, unfortunately for the WWE, the crowd mic was not up to its maximum at the time. It was half cut so that way people could hear and see, uh, so that way people could hear what was going on in the ring uh, more clearly. But if you watch crowd videos of Sting's debut, that crowd was hot. Yeah. That was the pop of the year. Unquestionably, nothing can top it. I don't care what the shit they pulled for the last Raw of the year. It's not going to be as big as... Yeah. It, what was funny is that almost everybody thought it was going to be like Randy Orton. I thought it was going to be Randy Orton that was going to be the guy. It's just like, okay, I'm waiting for it. Where's voices? I want to hear voices. And that fucking Sting and his weird-ass entrance music comes out. They, they need better more shit like this. Music. This is the perfect way to elevate jobbers. You can bring a jobber into the high-end mid-card immediately by doing something like this. It's such easy booking. Just Could pick you a guy. Like, no. Calcos, could you imagine if like fucking Heath Slater came out and saved the day? Well, it wouldn't be Heath Slater. If it would be more someone akin to Darren Young, David Atunga, or or Zack Ryder at this point, if Vince decides to embrace the power of the internet and elect Zack Ryder to internet championship once again, which will never happen. But I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, this match. Uh, I we I don't think we even need to go any further. Sting death drops. Uh, fucking Trips. Triple H. Uh, Dolph Ziggler wins. Cena comes in, gives a big warm embrace to Ziggler, puts Ziggler to the fucking moon. It was so good. That this- whole match was top to fucking bottom. A full hour of non-stop. Good. Just good. And then we go to TLC, and then we all know how that turns out. Worst yeah. pay-per-view of the year? Worst pay-per-view! Calm, you t- <laughs> calm yourself, Calcos. I love how we got- go from, like, fucking Survivor Series to TLC. <laughs> like, everything fucking goes to shit. Can we move on now? Okay, fine. All right. If we're talking about shockers, uh, with uh, with Lesnar, you know, breaking the streak with with the debut of Super Ziggler. How about we talk about what happened with the Shield? I want to say this: the Shield is one of my all time favorite factions because all three members work so beautifully together. And as of right now, with their current single star standings. They're doing really good. There's no Janetti in this sort of thing. They're all doing really good on their own. Rollins is Mr. Money in the Bank. Ambrose is like fucking Dean Ambrose. I'm Dean fucking Ambrose. I'm a crazy lunatic fringe motherfucker. And Roman Reigns is probably going to win the championship at this year's WrestleMania. So, they were doing really well as a team. 
we didn't know how long it was going to go on for, though. They had already won the tag team championship, so they could erase that like off their to-do list. So their feud with Evolution started off really interesting, how they were just constantly just beating the shit out of each other. But then, after, I believe it was after Extreme Rules, right? Yes, that sounds right. After Extreme Rules, you know, Triple H comes out and he's just like, oh, don't worry, there's always a plan B to get rid of you and all this other shit. And Seth Rollins, chair to reins. Ambrose has this legitimately shocked look. Chair to Ambrose. Reigns and Ambrose are down. And fucking Seth Rollins is standing on top. Look, Lisa, you can see the exact moment if you skip frame by frame when Dean Ambrose's heart was broken. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Click, click, and click there. Man, that, that for me was, I think... For me, that's the third biggest shocker of this year. Just nobody would have seen that coming. I would have thought it would have been Ambrose. Ambrose always seemed like the one that would do it. But then, nope, Rollins just to cashes honest, it all in. He, he literally cashes it all in because then he goes on to win Money in the Bank. And meanwhile, Ambrose and Reigns are like, okay, what the fuck? What do we do now? Well... At that point, it looked like Rollins was going to end up, like, once they broke up, it looked like Rollins was going to end up being the face that would come out of that group. Like I always thought that Ambrose or Reigns was going to be the two, or one of the two was going to be the hottest star out of all of them, but unfortunately, it looks like it's going to be Reigns. Mm. Which is funny, because before, when I saw him, I'm just like, okay, push this guy to the moon. I want to see this guy as world champion. But now, I'm all hesitant about him. Just like, eh, okay, we we get it. Reigns is is great. Stop shoving him down our throats. Just let him be naturally over. And stop giving him scripted promos, you stupid fucks. He's an articulate, smart guy. When you give him scripts, it doesn't work. Just let him say whatever the fuck he wants. And you can believe that. Oh, my fucking God. You know what? If that wasn't so appropriate, I would murder you right now. <laughs> and the uh, award for... No, they should have put this in the Slammys. And the award for the stupidest catchphrase this year. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, though. You're so goddamn right. Rollins could be so much better if they weren't so focused on marketing and if they weren't so focused on keeping everything as precise and perfect as possible because that's what made wrestling great back in the day when things were not perfect when things were not squeaky clean. I'm not even talking about Attitude Era. I'm just talking about in general. Promos are better when they are not scripted. Just give the wrestlers a series of bullet points and let them say things. If they can't talk very well, give them scripts. If they can, let them go. Just wind reins up and let him go. He doesn't need scripts. He's way better off without him. Remember the time when we were like, yay. Ron, or Reigns is going to go over. One of the young guys is finally or pushing past the Cena and Orton and all of those guys' era. We're moving into a new era with a bunch of good young talent. And uh, now yeah. all of a sudden, we just we can we have a mixed feeling toward him now. I still want Reigns to be the guy. I still have my prediction laid out, laid out that he's going to win the championship at this year's, uh, not this year, 2015's WrestleMania, WrestleMania 31. I still think that's going to happen. Don't mind and that I'm going to be happy the, that that happens. I don't mind that he's going to win the championship. I just mind that he's going to win the championship from Lesnar. I hate that. It, they have to do that because if they have to show that it's not going to be Cena that's going to eventually beat Lesnar. No, it has... no, no. Let Cena beat Lesnar. Let Cena beat Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. Why? Seth Rollins has the briefcase. But do you understand when Seth Rollins cashes in the briefcase, Dean Ambrose can't stop him because he's in the middle of a feud with Bray Wyatt. So Bray Wyatt can halt him from stopping Seth Rollins. Rollins gets the championship. He holds it to WrestleMania. Mania, you get a three-way between himself, Ambrose, and Reigns. Reigns wins the championship, and everybody goes home happy. Oh yeah, that's right. That was my original prediction, wasn't it? That is such a much better booking situation because okay. it doesn't make anybody look weak, and it doesn't make look make Reigns look fucking re, for the lack of a better term, retard strength. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I know that's really insensitive, but I don't know how else to put it at this point. No, I, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying. 
as long as he doesn't go super reigns. He's gonna go no, super reigns. No, no, he can do that fucking ridiculous Superman punch and then like, yeah. I, I just hate the fact I don't want Reigns to win the title off the back of Lesnar. I want Reigns to win the title off the back of Rollins because it's perfect justice for Rollins taking apart the shield earlier that year. It puts everything in a full fucking circle. That's what it does. It doesn't have to be Dean Ambrose for um for the championship. Dean Ambrose can go after the Intercontinental Championship and make that look good. Oh, you mean like how he made the United States Championship look? Ah, uh, you know what? Fuck it. Dean Ambrose can just do whatever the fuck he wants. All I know is that I want Reigns to win the title from Rollins, not Lesnar. I want things to go full circle. Oh, you you can't put that much faith in WWE. I can't put that much faith in WWE, but I can still say what I fucking want. This is true. Okay, I see your point. <laughs> I'm just frustrated with the whole thing. Otherwise, the Shield breakup was a very interesting thing because it happened during a time when they were so hot. They still had a lot of potential and a lot of things that they could do, but they broke it up early. They they shot the gun very early, which in a way is kind of a good thing because nobody would have fucking expected it. And they did it when people still cared instead of waiting for it to get really overused and tired and beaten. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to take a little break here. This is the end of part one, so just wait a little bit and then here's part two. Get right over there once I learned to edit this shit. <laughs> 